Welcome back. Well, APAC and the U.S. administration haven't always been best friends, as many would believe. Back in 2004, the FBI and the U.S. Justice Department's Counterintelligence Bureau revealed they were investigating a top Pentagon analyst. He was suspected of handing over highly classified documents to APAC, which in turn handed them over to the Israeli embassy in Washington. The suspect, Larry Franklin, who was later sentenced to more than 12 years in prison, worked closely with other high-ranking Pentagon officials. He was the senior analyst on Iran, which tops APAC's lists of targets. So, is APAC a lobbying group or an intelligence gathering network on behalf of Israel? Well, we're still joined by our guests. They're all in Washington, Philip Weiss, Eli Lake and Munthia Suleiman. Eli Lake, let me come back to you first. I mean, some critics may say that APAC is indeed an intelligence gathering organization for a foreign government, i.e. Israel. What's your yeah. take on that? Well, people who say that are idiots and they don't know what they're talking about and usually they're trying to uh, basically defame Israel or the pro-Israel lobby on behalf of usually a foreign government like Iran or Saudi Arabia. But that said, the case that you described, ultimately Larry Franklin and uh, Keith Weissman and Steve Rosen, were all charged ultimately with disclosing uh, defense information to the public. The fact that they gave it to a guy named Naur Gilon, who worked in the U.S., uh, the Israel Embassy in Washington, Gilon stayed in his post, was never made persona non grata, and indeed met extensively with the White House after this entire investigation, not to mention other individuals who were mentioned in the indictment were promoted, given further clearance and access to intelligence. I've covered a lot of spy cases in my time. I'm an intelligence reporter. I can tell you that the first thing that happens in an actual espionage investigation is that the suspected agents or uh, spies are literally sent home. In this case, this was really a prosecution of leaking to the public, and I would think that people who sort of have made a big deal out of this, uh, you know, in the sort of net left and the internet blogs um, would uh, be very careful about wanting to uh, say anything about the prosecution of leakers given the fact that most of their tall tales about neocons and pre-war intelligence come from the very kind of anonymous leaking that is being prosecuted. Okay, well let's put that point to Munther Suleiman. No, I mean, does the, does the Wiseman yeah. Rosen case underline the fact that APAC is willing to go to any means to get the information they want, even spy? You, you know, Israel you is a mercenary state from? for the United States. And at the same time, uh, they have, uh, at the same time, all those cases of spying cases are uh, at the tip of the iceberg. Uh, what's ironic about all of this is that the lack of criticism even or debate in the United States about such action like Israel. You, you could see no even criticism inside the Congress or inside any administration or any politician will dare to criticize Israel, while they can criticize themselves, you can have open debate in Israel about the action that Israel is taking, but you cannot have the same debate in the United States. So uh, this, this is the ironic thing. I don't have no illusion about the display of power of this lobby, but this lobby also has some limitation. This lobby happened to serve the interest of the mil military industrial lobby or complex the other uh, milit other uh, interest uh, in the United States that uh, really lie behind those who are making decision in the United States. Okay. But at the same time, let's let's not forget that in this election, in the coming election, the Hispanic vote, the black vote, and even the Islamic and Arab vote are going to be more significant than this traditionally we think that the Jewish vote going to be the determining factor in this election. Let's Money is still at the core of politics of the United States and because the perception that the Jewish and reality that they fund uh, their politics and they fund their agenda, they are more successful okay, than others. Let's, let's, let's move the conversation on and bring in back uh, Philip Weiss. I mean, Philip Weiss, as uh, Munta Suleiman was saying there, it's an election year. All eyes were on Barack Obama um, as he addressed uh, AIPAC. I mean, how does AIPAC view Barack Obama? Do they see him as somebody who can advance their cause? I mean, this is a man who said uh, just a few months ago that uh, he would negotiate with many of Israel's enemies. I think that AIPAC is, uh, is trying to warm up to Barack Obama. Uh, the reception of Hillary Clinton was much warmer. They, there's a lot of mistrust of Barack Obama. But I think that they, have, they will embrace him, uh, basically because they have to, uh, because uh, AIPAC has great respect for power. 
And I guess that is the one point that I would emphasize here is that while I agree with Eli about the question of intelligence gathering, I think that I, 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 I don't even know about the case. I don't find that very meaningful as a way of understanding APAC. The most important thing in understanding APAC is that 15 years ago or 17 years ago when Jim Baker, the Secretary of State, went to APAC and said, give up the settlements of the West Bank, give up the idea of greater Israel, he was booed. And this APAC conference, that idea is welcomed. Why is it welcomed? Because Israel has moved to that point of view. Americans, Ameri uh, the American presidencies, uh, 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 the, 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 the desire by the American president to condemn those settlements, which actually Barack Obama did in mild terms today, has always been nullified by APAC, and that is the problem, nullification of American policy. Eli Lake, just a quick question to you. I mean, Barack Obama said in the past that he'd be willing uh, to negotiate with Tehran over the nuclear issue, but that's not something that APAC and the Jewish lobby want to see, is it? Well, uh, you know, I, 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 I got to tell you that I think that, the, 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 that what Barack Obama has now said, he said he would be willing to meet with Kim Jong-il, Hugo Chavez, Fidel Castro, face to face. He said that almost a year ago. As his campaign has evolved, what he's saying now is that he would pursue diplomacy in order to stop Iran's building of a nuclear weapon and to stop their support for terrorism. He's criticized the Iraq war on the grounds that it's made Iran stronger, so he's identifying Iran as a threat. And finally, he said that he wouldn't pursue diplomacy or that he would keep all of his options open. That's actually really not that far from what Bush is saying. So, I mean, I, I guess, you know, I, I don't really think that, I think what APAC tends to do, and I think there's a big misperception here, uh, no offense, is that APAC focuses largely on Congress and almost exclusively in terms of substantive legislation, in terms of congressional sanctions, which are usually symbolic, and of course the foreign aid budget. What APAC doesn't do, and there's a whole other el realm of foreign policy, which involves what presidents say, the kind of secret diplomacy, overt diplomacy, intelligence gathering okay. from the CIA, uh, black operations, and all of these things, APAC has no say at all. Okay, that's fine. And it's not something that APAC influences. A so okay. I'm saying that when you talk about foreign policy, APAC you think it's just Congress. For APAC. You know, and I just think that's as a foreign agent. Munta Suleiman, let me, let me get a final APAC thought from you because we're running, we're running, running out of time. Munta Suleiman, let me ask you a final question on the future. Munta Suleman, let me ask you a final question. Okay, well, let me throw the question to Philip Weiss. Let me throw the question to Philip Weiss, as both of you argue. Philip Weiss, a final question on the future of the Jewish lobby. Are we going to see more alternative voices like J Street emerging to challenge groups like APAC? Well, within the Jewish community, APAC understands that it faces something of a crisis. APAC is broadening its appeal. One of the very impressive things that APAC is doing right now is reaching out to college students, students of color, Christians, and that's very impressive. One of the reasons it's doing so is that it fears that young Jews are beginning to listen to the Arab narrative. Okay, let me get a final thought from Muntha Suleiman, and please be brief because we're running out of time. What do you think the real challenges are ahead for APAC, particularly with these ideological changes sweeping the US and the Democrats possibly in power after November? I think there is a competing forces. America is awakening to the reality that the interest of the United States is different, does not coincide with the interest of the mercenary state, criminal state of Israel. And there should be, America should be uh, true to its ideal of justice and equality throughout the world. A foreign policy that take into consideration the well-being of American and the rest of the world and uh, try to resolve all the outstanding issues diplomatically and use the soft power and with cooperation with the entire world. I think uh, APAC, it's going to diminish its power as we see more blocks, voting bloc in the United States are moving uh, in more prominence and more organization and they can influence policy. And APAC must, and there's going to be pressure to be registered a foreign agent because it acts and practice as a foreign agent. Okay, gentlemen, we have to leave it there. Munthe Suleiman, Philip Weiss and Eli Lake, thank you all very much indeed for your involvement. And thank you so much for joining us here on this edition of Inside Story. We, of course, welcome your comments and your suggestions. Please email them to us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. From the whole team here, goodbye for now.